Hello folks, Nathan here. Um, we're in the book In His Service, The Christian Calling to Charity, and in the 17th chapter thereof, uh, by Rusus John Rushnuni, R.J. Rushnuni. <clears throat> so, let's make it happen. 17. Compassion. The word compassion has suffered from liberal misuse in the post-World War... The word compassion has suffered from liberal misuse in the post-World War II era. The word is common to the Bible and translates several Hebrew and Greek words, and it deserves re And it deserves rehabilitation. Liberals use the word to justify legislation, whereas in its biblical origins its meaning relates to personal attitudes and action. Some of the words used in the Bible are 1. Chamal, Quamal, to commiserate, have compassion, pity, to spare, Hebrew, 2. Rakam, Rokam, from the roots to fondle, to love compassionately, to be merciful, to have pity, Hebrew. Three, rakam, rakam, from from number two. Sorry. From number two, with the same implications, but implying the womb and the unborn babe, tender love and caring. Hebrew. 4. Rakum, from number 2, full of compassion and mercy. Hebrew. Uh, splag, splag, chin, nose, nezomai, splag, 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 ch, splag, chisnomai. Splag Chisnomai. Hey man, give me some of that Splag Chisnomai. Eh? I like. It's very good. Splag Chisnomai. Five. Splag Chisnomai. Greek. To have bowels or yearn. Feel sympathy and pity. To be moved. Six. Eleo. Eleo. Greek. To have compassion. Pity or mercy. 7. Oiktiero, Greek, to exercise compassion, pity. 8. Metripothio, Metriopatho, Patheo, Metriopatho, 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 Greek, to be gentle and treat kindly, to be compassionate. 9. Sympathio, Greek, having a fellow feeling, to have compassion. 10. Sympathes, Greek, mutually commiserate and compassionate. In the context of their use, these words refer to more than feeling. They are part of the requirement of community under the triune God and his law. Now, the word compassion is a key to the history of Christianity, and hence very important. The requirements for compassion came from God's law, but Christianity gave it a new and working focus. In the synagogue, the leader assigned visitors to members for hospitality, but in the church the bishop had to be a lover of hospitality, Titus 1, 7 and 8. Members of the Order of Widows had to have a history of caring for the strangers and the afflicted, 1 Timothy 5.10. The apostles took works of compassion so seriously that it interfered with their ministerial work and the Order of Deacons was established, Acts 6, 1-6. This emphasis on compassion did not impress the Greco-Roman elite. For them, it marked all Christians as lower class, despite the presence of many very superior men among them. Paul's status as a Christian, for example, was a matter of amazement to some Romans. 
While the vast population of slaves and poor people responded at times with startled attention and approval to the compassion of Christians, the leaders were repelled by it. As good enough noted, quote, The elite structure could not live side by side with Christian compassion. End quote. Two motives were thus in conflict. Roman elitism versus Christian compassion. These two forces are with us still, but in altered forms. Elitism in Rome dealt with the poor in political motives. It provided bread and circuses to keep the poor satisfied and safe. Elitism in the modern world is as contemptuous of the poor as any noble Roman, but it shows the effects of Christian civilization. Compassion is now a socially approved and politically necessary virtue, and its expression is status welfareism. The goal is to satisfy the poor and to keep them far from the rich. Compassion has thus become an instrument of elitism rather than of Christian community. Two Alien faiths and hopes lie behind elitism and Christianity. The elitist wants to alleviate need and maintain political and social order. His hope is that education and social action will in time elevate the poor masses to a higher and more rational level. Galby and Purdue have pointed out that in England, while Christian reforms work to make men more godly and thereby to raise them out of their poverty and sin, the Enlightenment men place their hope in making men more rational. The goal thus became financial security for the family so that respectability would follow, a goal some Christians also gave assent to. A variety of institutions were created to further this goal. As against state welfareism and education, Christians who were pioneers in both charity and education placed their essential hope on regeneration. A good society requires regenerate men, a godly people. Thus, two alien faiths were in conflict. Kingsley saw the difference. Quote, it is much cheaper and pleasanter to be reformed by the devil than by God, for God will only reform society on the condition of our reforming every man of his own. This is hot stuff, man. For God will only reform society on the condition of our reforming every man his own self, while the devil is quite ready to help us mend the laws and the parliament, earth and heaven, without ever starting such an impertinent and personal request as that a man should mend himself. End quote. In the elitist tradition, various alternatives have been used to reform society by means of the state, education, welfareism, legislation and revolution. Christian socialism very early tried to unite biblical faith with enlightenment humanism. In time, of course, the Christian emphasis was shelved. Quote, the suggestion for the peaceful regeneration of the race by the cultivation of individual character, I am quoting from Bernard Shaw's History of the Fabian Society, was not accepted. Certain members of that circle, says Shaw, modestly feeling that the revolution would have to wait an unreasonably long time if it postponed until they personally had attained perfection, set up the banner of socialism militant, end quote. Compassion thus ceased to be a Christian concern for many. It ceased to be essentially a personal religious... Con It ceased to be essentially a personal religious concern, however expressed in person by the church or by some Christian agency, and it became a political and economic cause. The agency of compassion became the state. In this process, however, something was lost. The word compassion continued in use, but its root meaning to bear, to suffer with, by personal action, has given way to legislative action which distances the poor, the sick and the needy from us. But this is not all. The statist emphasis has meant the priority of politico-economic determination. As a result, morality, the foundation of Christian compassion, now is seen as economically determined. 
Thus, Harrison, in discussing marriage, agrees with Marx that the ideas of the ruling class are the governing ideas, and these are materialistically or economically determined. Thus, sexual codes in marriage, like all morality, are created to protect the ruling class and their interests. We live in an era when remarkable instances of compassion can be found all over the world. An occasional Christian, such as Mother Teresa, not at all unusual in her com. Not at all unusual in her accomplishments gains public attention, but most Catholic and Protestant are neglected or harassed. The extent of their importance is belitted quite belitted. I like to be little little in the little, little. The extent of their importance is belitted belittled. I like to be lit get lit in the party tonight. Great googly moogly. What goeth on? What is goeth on? The extent of their importance is belittled quite commonly. A Mother Teresa is not presented as an instance of centuries old and commonplace Christian grace in action, but as a romantic tale. Such an approach actually belittles the nature and scope of Christian compassion. The modern attribute attitude. The modern attitude has deep roots, an incident reflecting the envy and resentment for the power of Charles Borromeo by the representative of King Philip of Spain and the Marquis of Diamante, is telling, quote, Charles Borromeo's life, too, was an example of sudden and dramatic changes of fortune. It might have been expected that after the plague, when he had become the idol of the people, the rest of his life would have slipped away in peace and popularity. Ayamonte had come back to Milan and helped to carry the canopy over the Archbishop in the Holy Neil procession of May 1577 and received from him a facsimile of the Neil as a sign of renewed friendship, October 1577. Yet, when the city was at last free from the plague, he said to the Archbishop, with an all but incredible mixture of rudeness and stupidity, It is most painful for me to see how everyone in Milan loves you, you are most worshipped, while I, I, the minister of the most powerful king, am barely tolerated. As early as March that year, Borromeo had been told that Ayamonte had so poisoned Philip's mind that he talked of asking the Pope to remove this ambitious priest from Milan. That is no news to me, had been Borromeo's answer. End quote. Besides his work during the plague, when 17,000 died in Milan, 8,000 in the neighbouring countryside and 120 priests, Borromeo's charities included the following, a hostel for beggars and tramps, orphanages for boys and girls, orphanages for boys and girls, a home for reformed prostitutes, another for homeless girls, and, interestingly enough, a home for unhappily married women. He also provided diaries to enable penniless girls to marry, otherwise they would have been pushed into prostitution. He originated the idea of a state pawn shop for the poor to help them escape usurious pawnbrokers. Borromeo was a man of his time. His view of Protestants, with whom he had little contact, was conventional. He regarded the Turks as less dangerous than Luther and Calvin. At the same time, when confronted by human need and suffering, like many equally narrow Protestants of his day, he was a man of compassion. Status, quote-unquote, of compassion, if it could be called that, led to serious and abiding problems which helped destroy Rome. The same elitist compassion is basic to many problems of state today. The Christians did not waste time warning against Roman welfareism. They were men of compassion and charity, and they stressed the regeneration of men and nations by Jesus Christ. 
Raro. Only me. Took my burgers. Probably too many burgers, to be honest. So we're in the book In His Service, The Christian Calling to Charity. 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 So uh, why don't we begin by beginning? Eighteen. Solutions. To believe that man-made problems can be solved is a sound and legitimate belief in most cases. Of course, we cannot reverse time and events to undo the evil done, but many problems are capable of a solution. There are, however, problems in solving problems. First, too many people want instant answers and solutions. Our Lord tells us, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Mark 4.28 We cannot reap a harvest immediately after the seed is sown. Growth takes time, and so does problem-solving. Quick and superficial, quote, solutions, end quote, can lead to more serious problems. Second, solutions are sometimes more desired than resolutions. That is, a desire to make peace can lead to a forced harmony. In too many instances, a guilty person is allowed to make an apology without restitution or reconciliation is insisted on without even a trace of regrets on the part of the guilty party. Many other false forms of solutions can be cited, but our central concern is, third, that solutions which evade the central moral issue are both false and evil. Education in our day is humanistic. Therefore, at its best, it is technical and factual, not Christian. The modern era began with an exaltation of mathematics, a legitimate area of study, but hardly a discipline to condition all others. In school, we are taught that 2 plus 2 equals 4, which is true enough, but very few answers in life are as easy or as abstract. In high school geometry, I heard some students express a desire that all life and thought could be reduced, like geometry, to a handful of axioms and propositions. Over the generations, men like Spinoza have tried to do just that, but 2 plus 2 f equals 4. Over the generations, men like Spinoza have tried to do just that, but 2 plus 2 equals 4 is an abstraction and a technical answer. Most of man's problems are neither technical nor abstractions. They are moral and personal. What answers are possible when man is resolutely evil? How can a family crisis be resolved when the members are all evil and persistent in their evil? What answer is there to rulers who are evil and have most people on their side? Again, when churchmen are evil, how can the church be other than evil? Very often, reform and change are the least desired solutions. To expect answers, then, is itself evil. It is rather a time for judgment and rebuilding. The Wall Street Journal, February the 3rd, 1988, carried a long report on the abuse of elderly people, often by their children. One woman had a two-inch scar in her forehead. She had been struck by an iron skillet. A jagged mark in the nose and under one eye came from a kick with a steel-toed shoe. This injury put her into a hospital for a month. The guilty parties were a son and daughter-in-law. The woman was not allowed to use her own stove or refrigerator and ate at a neighbour's. On occasion, she'd been locked out of her own apartment. The woman, however, refuses to file charges against her son so that his evil is matched by her evil in condoning the offence. A Congressional subcommittee estimates the number of such assaults to be about 1,100,000 a year, with the reported cases of such abuse increasing rapidly. Some cases result in death. 
legislation will not remove such problems from a civilization. First, while laws punishing such offences exist and are necessary, the laws are solving nothing. Even when the injured file charges, no real change occurs all too often. Probation, or a short sentence, may follow, and then the consequences are worse. The angry criminal exacts his revenge too often. Court orders forbidding any molestation or return to the house are routinely ignored. Second, the basic problem of evil is not resolved. The problem of sin is not solvable on a technical basis. It is not a two plus two problem. It requires the regeneration of a man to be resolved. It is true that some who are poor and needy respond with gratitude when they are helped. It is also true that some respond with evil, with a desire to hurt and exploit their good Samaritan as a fool. Don't expect me to be grateful, one woman contemptuously told a woman who helped and wanted to see the woman use the help constructively. A man, after exploiting and robbing his benefactor, said, We both get something... Jerk aside. We both got something out of this. You got the satisfaction of doing good, and I got the satisfaction I wanted. Does this mean that we should cease from doing good, or from being charitable? By no means, but it requires us to recognise that sin exists on all sides and in all kinds of men. Being in a pitiable condition makes no man good. If we assume that our charity or goodness will change people, then we are, like status welfare workers, thinking humanistically. No man's goodness can change the heart of another man. Only God can. If we place the primary emphasis of our charity on charity itself, that is, the fact of help to others, we go astray. Similarly, we cannot make pity our primary motivation. Divorced from a theological context, pity readily becomes sentimentality and has, as William Blake wanted, merely a human face. It is a humanism in action and, in that form, pity for the needy can easily combine with hatred for the affluent. In the Bible, compassion or pity is always associated with grace. Having received the grace of God, we manifest it to others. We too often hear of people who show compassion to the poor and needy, but less often that they're... But less often that their motivation is grace. When grace is our motivation, we know the limitations of our efforts and how limited is the good we can do and how great God's power and works. As we survey the evil in men, both high and low, we know that the resolution lies in God's sovereign grace. For us, then, the necessity is to recognise that the cross means judgment on sin. If God the Son, as man's last Adam, undergoes judgment for his people, how can men and nations expect to evade judgment for sin? We know they shall be judged. Our duty is to obey our Lord, be charitable where we can, and to know that, however miserable may be the results that we see, in Jesus Christ our labour is not in vain, but will accomplish his purpose. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Our work is thus one of reconstruction, knowing that the design is not of us, but the Lord What a beautiful chapter that was. Wow, that was awesome. Oops, what did I do there? Okay, so uh, I'm not taking a break. I'm not um, cutting it off here since we have time to go, but um, I will say that if you want to support this work, you can like, share, comment, send me a message, give me a high five. Don't give me a nudge. I don't want it to be nudged or poked. No, thank you very much. Um, if you want to support the work financially so it can do more better, more better work, then uh, you can go to nathanteacher.com and click on the donate.
Donate, hey. Donate, donate. Donate. That's better now. All right, so we're going to go into chapter 19. Nineteen. Widows, orphans, and the poor. Like the pagan Romans who saw the present and the future commanded by Christians, contemporary humanistic scholars, sensing the threat to their statist world order, lash out savagely against Christianity. R. L. Reich in Apex Omnium, Religion in the Res Gestae of Amanius, studies a history written by the pagan Roman Amanius, Amianus, Amianus. Laudate, laudate, the Latin la la. Amanius. R. L. Reich in Apex Omnium, Religion in the Res Gestae of Amianus, studies the history written by the pagan Roman Amianus Marcellianus, Marcellinus. By the pagan. Studies the history written by the pagan Roman Ammianus Marcellinus at the end of the 4th century AD. In a long review article, J. W. Jameson agrees with Ammianus and Edward Gibbon in The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in blaming the fall of Rome on Christianity. Reich presents Ammianus' thesis with apparent favour. Roman paganism was an ethnic religion, a religion of the family and the state. Like Shintoism, it was a racial or ethnic faith limited to one people, and hence it was not missionary-minded, nor other than aristocratic. Christianity, however, was and is missionary-minded, and according to Reich and Jameson, equalitarian as against the racial was Equalitarian as against the radical inequalitarianism of ethnic religions. Loyalty to Jesus Christ replaced loyalty to the Roman state and its emperor. Ammianus saw ethnic faiths as superior. Quote, By contrast, Christianity is a worthless religion which serves not to strengthen, but to weaken the empire. End quote. Reich, according to Jameson, sees with Ammianus Christianity as quote, a distraction from the task of imperium. End quote. Modern paganism is still extensively coloured by biblical premises consciously or unconsciously. Our modern humanistic statism, whether Marxist or democratic, professes to rule in the name of the people. Curiously, the people have less and less place in the plans of these new elitists. Like Roman welfareism of old, modern welfare does not bond the recipients to the donors. Status welfareism establishes no personal relationship. It is this personal relationship as, quote, members one of another, end quote, Ephesians 4.25, that Christianity fosters, not equalitarianism as such. This is clearly apparent in James 2, 1 to 10, quote, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? For if there come unto our assembly a man of for if there come unto our assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? 
Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfil the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, ye do well. Hanifard. <clears throat> Visit the Hanover. Be visiting Hanover is good. <clears throat> if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. End quote. Respect or regard of persons is repeatedly condemned in the law as a perversion of justice by judges. Deuteronomy 117. This law also applies to human relations. To favour a person because of his wealth is to be partial and to become judges of evil thoughts. Verse 4. In a fallen world, wealth is power, and such power is routinely used against believers. Verses 5-7 to seven. For Christians to show respect of persons is to acquiesce in the very evil which oppresses them. James is not asking for equalitarianism, but for no respect of persons. There's a difference. That one man is a wealthy industrialist and another is a very poor day labourer, these are facts which only communism can equalise, only to create greater evils. The biblical cons- the biblical concern is that both men must be seen from the Lord's perspective as alike in need of grace from Him and of justice and mercy from us. To keep the royal law, to love our neighbour as ourselves, verse 8, means to respect his person, his family, thou shalt not commit adultery, his property, thou shalt not steal, his life, thou shalt not kill, and his reputation, thou shalt not bear false witness. It means also that, as members one of another, we are mindful of the needs of others. There is a very important insight into this in Daniel Daniel was asked by Nebuchadnezzar to interpret a strange dream, which he does reluctantly. God, he tells the king, is bringing judgment upon him for two reasons. Quote, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquillity. Daniel 4.27 First, Nebuchadnezzar lacks righteousness or justice. Second, he does not show mercy to the poor. For these two reasons, God was destroying Nebuchadnezzar's mind for a time until understanding in the form of justice and mercy to the poor commanded his life and thought. Clearly, God regards these two things important enough to overthrow a Nebuchadnezzar for a season and to bring down Rome. It's interesting to note that in the medieval era, charity was often imposed as a penance for sin on proud and arrogant lords. A delightful episode of such a penance occurred in the first half of the 14th century. Sir Eustace d'Ambreticourt stole a nun, Elizabeth of Juliers, a niece of Queen Philippa of England, wife of Edward III, and widow of John, Earl of Kent, out of the convent, he found a hedge priest, John Ireland, and he married them. As penance, Archbishop Islip required Elizabeth to recite daily the seven penitential psalms, the fifteen gradual psalms, the litany, placebo, and dear J. Quote, Archbishop Islip also required both of them to give freely to the poor whenever they had carnal intercourse. Word quickly spread of the benefits attended upon their matrimonial exertions, and most mornings Eustace found himself cheered on by clamorous villagers. <laughs> End quote. 
While Archbishop Islip's requirements involved some humour, his course of action had deep roots in church history. Biblical faith requires repentance for sins, godly repentance being an inner sorrow joined to outward acts such as restitution and penance. Restitution requires a restoration with penalty of whatever has been stolen or destroyed, where restitution could not be made because of the nature of the sin, penance became commonplace. Penance meant an outward profession of sorrow. While penance later became formal and less vital, in the early church it commonly had to be shown by charity to the poor. As Bingham noted, quote, And because mercy and liberality to the poor was a great argument and evidence of repentance, this was always in eminent degree exacted of them, of penitence. Cyprian puts this among the other indications of repentance. Can we think, says he, that man laments with his whole heart and deprecates? That that man laments with his whole heart and deprecates the Lord with fasting, weeping and mourning, who, from the moment of his sinning, daily frequents the baths, who feeds himself with luxurious feasting and fills his belly to an extraordinary pitch, only to belch forth his crudities the day after, who imparts not his meat and drink to the necessities of the poor? How does he bewail his own death, who walks about with a merry and cheerful countenance, who trims his beard and attires his face? Does he think to please men who displeases God? Does that woman lament and mourn who is at leisure to put on her costly clothing and never thinks of the garment of Christ which she has lost? End quote. In such case, he thinks charity to the poor would be a more becoming ornament than all their silks and jewels and gold. Therefore he advises them to put on the ornament of Christ, that they might not appear naked before him. End quote. Cyprian stressed charity in writing to the clergy, saying, quote, I request that you will diligently take care of the widows, and of the sick, and of all the poor. Moreover, you may supply the expenses for strangers, if any should be in <clears throat> if any should be indigent from my own portion, which I have left with Rogatianus. Rogatianus. The portion which I have left with Rogatianus, our fellow presbyter. End quote. In his three books of testimonies against the Jews, Cyprian strongly stressed charity and tied it to being members of one another. Heading 3 is titled, quote, That charity and brotherly affection are to be religiously and steadfastly practised. Heading 113 reads, quote, That the widow and orphan ought to be protected. In Solomon, be merciful to the orphan as a father and as a husband to their mother and thou shalt be the son of the highest, if thou shalt obey. Eccles 4.10, also in Exodus. Ye shall not afflict any widow or orphan, but ye shall afflict him. But if ye afflict him. But if ye afflict them, and they cry out and call unto me, I will hear their cryings, and will be angry and mind against you, and I will destroy you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children orphans. Exodus 22, 22-24 Also in Isaiah, Judge for the fatherless, and justify the widow, and come, let us reason, saith the Lord. Isaiah 1, 17 and 18 Also in Job, I have preserved the poor man from the hand of the mighty, and I have helped the fatherless, who had no helper. The mouth of the widow hath blessed me. Job. Job 29, 12 and 13. Also in the 68th Psalm, the father of the orphans and the judge of the widows. 
sorry, I'm not that good. <laughs> I'm obviously not good with the, but I'm a 50, uh, 50, 78, 68, 68, 5. Ah, uh, it says 68. Ah. Psalm 68, 5, end quote. Note Cyprian's reference to Exodus 22, 22 to 24. Verse 21 in that chapter requires justice for aliens. The penalty promised by God is the other side of the golden rule. In Obadiah 15 we read, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. End quote. This is related also to the judgment of Nebuchadnezzar. God declares in Exodus 22, 21-24 that if men in societies oppress the poor, if they afflict the widow and the orphan, he will recompense them with death and will make the widows of their... and will make widows of their wives and orphans of their children. Quite obviously, this is not an insignificant matter to God. Rome did not fall because of the Christians, but by God's judgment and decree. Churchmen and nations had better take note. This is an awesome book, eh? Okay? Okay, I'm going to stop it there. We kind of reached our quota. Kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, which reached our quota uh, for this particular episode. So thanks for listening and like, share, and do all those good things. Thanks very nice and see you at another time.